So, um, as you know, today we are unveiling a portrait of Di Dwight Allen. And uh, I understand there's a story behind that. Because as the story goes, in our library, you can see, in, our, in our lobby, you can see the portrait of Dean Purvis and Foster Furcolo. And as I understand it, one time there was a portrait of Dwight there. And something happened, you know, some kind of prank. <laughs> and I'm kind of wondering if one of you might come up after and explain to me what really happened to the uh, portrait. It's probably in a place of honor in your basement. <laughs> but right now, we're here to unveil a second portrait, one that really reminds us of the Dwight Allen, the Dean of Legend, the iconic Dean of the School of Ed, the Dean of the Pikes Peak Retreat, uh, the Dean of the heady times of the late 60s and early 70s, and, but also Dwight Allen, the mentor and friend who has maintained relationships with so many of you, and of uh, the students he inspired. Now, one of those students is, uh, I guess, probably, Masha probably doesn't know I'm going to tell the story, uh, but Masha was a student in the PhD program in English um, in education and working um, as an instructor here and that was when Dwight convinced her to change pathways and go into education and she, she had a long and productive career as a scholar here. Um, but it's another one of our students who is responsible for bringing us today. Uh, Dr. Timothy Taylor, who received his EDD in 2004, is currently a teaching fellow at Hong Kong Institute of Education. And over the past several decades, Tim and Dwight have worked together to improve the educational, uh, improve education for poor students in China, particularly girls. And last year, Tim sent me an email and he said he always felt indebted to, to Dwight and he wanted to thank him and the school by returning a portrait of D Dean Allen to its home on the walls of Furcolo. So how did Tim know there had been a portrait there? Oh, it was <laughs> when it was there? No, he heard about it, and oh. he, was, he was mad that it disappeared. Okay. We, we actually looked in to see if it was stored somewhere, just out of curiosity's sake, but we didn't no, find it. No, it wasn't. Oh, it wasn't. Well, I'm sure there's more to the story. <laughs> so Tim commissioned an artist um, to paint Dwight's portrait, and it arrived here in August, and now we're here to uh, unveil it so we can install it in the space in the lobby. Um, and I'd like to read a little from the moving tribute that uh, Tim sent us. You'll get a copy of it, but we hadn't handed it out yet, right? Because it shows the portrait. So we wanted to unveil it. Okay. So Tim wrote, I met Dwight when I was just 19 years old as a freshman at Old Dominion University. Most of my life I had thought about becoming a teacher, but I was unsure about making a commitment to the profession. So after graduation, I enrolled at Old Dominion University as a business major. When I entered Dwight's class in my second semester, I knew nothing about his work in education, his long list of publications, <laughs> his awards, or his international prestige as an educator. He was just another professor. The class was freshman English, and I had tried unsuccessfully to sign on with a different professor. But I learned on the first day of class how fortunate I really was. Dwight's classroom was alive with learning. Dwight would lean back on the table and orchestrate discussions that made me feel like a student in a school of Athens. Different setting, different millennium, but the same electric joy of discovery and deep learning. I soon changed my major to English and education. Sounds familiar, Masha. That was almost 30 years ago. I'm just one of many educators with a story about how Dwight has helped them become a better teacher, design a better curriculum, or help build a better school. I picture the community of students and educators that he has mentored throughout his life as expanding ripples of influence on education that have reached around the world and continue to make waves. But there's no doubt that many of those ripples began at the University of Massachusetts where Dwight made his biggest splash. It is my honor on behalf of all his students to donate the gift of this portrait to the School of Ed to return Dwight's smile to Furcola Hall where the legacy of his commitment to excellence in education goes on. 
So we thanked him for that wonderful tribute. And before we unveil the portrait, I'd like to introduce uh, Richard Holtzman, uh, who received his EDD in 1970. He's currently a Dean of American International College, and he's a member of the Dean's Leadership Council. Thank you, Chris. Uh, I didn't know I was going to speak here because I thought I was just going to speak at lunch, so I don't want to really repeat myself and I don't want to speak too long because so much has been said about Dwight and he has done uh, so much. And, uh, that's okay, uh, it's, just Dwight more time. That's right, that's right. So I want to make sure that he has enough time to talk about it and um, I, I don't want to compare Dwight to a hurricane very often. <laughs> his, his work has been like a hurricane. He's kept us all on edge and concerned about the uh, state of education and the future of education. Uh, then, as now, he continues to be an incredible force for change. And I could go on uh, for quite a while talking about some of the things that I remember he talked about almost as exact quotes, like teachers should not be used as interchangeable parts. Do you remember that, Dwight? Okay, and that we no, all look at right differentiating no, teaching. Right no, it's not the right answer. And we ought to differentiate teaching so that people can work at different levels and make their contributions at different levels. And now he's uh, really into big activities in China and worldwide, and I think we need to hear from our great mentor, our great friend who has transformed our lives. But first. <laughs> The official unveiling. I'm sure you're going to help you. Oh, I'm, oh okay. <laughs> <laughs> because they won't pay attention. They're going to see how it works well, first. I think it would be, yeah. I like white hysteria. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Cool. So, ta da! Having never done this before, there he is. discussion whether there should be a can of tab in the background, <laughs> and uh, my wife vetoed it. <laughs> she said that that wasn't dignified. <laughs> so uh, uh, I, I voted for it, <laughs> but I was outvoted. Uh, it's wonderful to be here, and it's wonderful to feel the spirit of innovation that is still here in the school. And that spirit feels very strong, but it also feels stuck. It feels stuck by the circumstances that, that just surround us and, and distract us and compel us to uh, revert to the old ways. Uh, and I spent a lot of time thinking about that. And, I conveyed to uh, Chris my suggestion for a million dollar project that might help us get unstuck, but I don't want to prejudice her consideration of that by... And you'll be passing the hat around. <laughs> <laughs> no, but I think, I think that we can, we can find a, a lever, a lever that can take uh, the legacy of the past and help transform it into a vehicle for success in the future. There are so many memories because the things that we were doing then are still agendas that remain now. Uh, the, uh, the good news is that it's not nearly so exceptional to have minority doctorates now as it was at that time, uh, but at, still there is an underrepresentation of the diversity of our society in the leadership roles in education. 
there's a scarcity. One, one of our graduates that is down at uh, uh, Clemson uh, has a wonderful program called Call Me Mister, which is taking former gang members and turning them into elementary teachers. Isn't that kind of cool? And they love it. They love it. And, and they are the most exciting, vibrant kids you can imagine. I had an exciting weekend down there with them. And, and uh, uh, that program is now spread to, uh, I think, about a dozen different institutions. And it's a wonderful program. And so there are little points of light that are out there, but the job is still overwhelming, and uh, we have to not rest because we've made a little bit of progress. Uh, I am dismayed that the grandest accomplishment of the Gates Foundation in education is, is emblematic, its emblem is the Salman Khan Institute, which is the absolutely very best way you could imagine to teach 19th century curriculum. And we're just stuck. We're stuck. We can't get out of 19th century curriculum. Now, people are amazed that I supported the high stakes testing because I support it. Why? Because for Many, many years, the profession dodged accountability. We refused to be accountable. We had all the excuses of why we couldn't be accountable. Teaching was too complex and blah, 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 blah. And, and you know, the famous quote of the kindergarten teacher, I'll give you a six months unconditional guarantee on everything that I do. You know, people were asking kindergarten teachers, will, will what you do get my kid into Harvard? And, uh, you know, I mean, it's crazy. But that craziness uh, has kept us from moving forward. Why? My guess is that the worst impediment that we have is because Ron Hamilton hasn't done his job well. <laughs> and Ron, here's a challenge for you. Uh, Ron is in, in evaluation. And the problem with high stakes testing is that the high stakes tests that we have measure particulate knowledge and itty bitty things that are easily measured. Now, you won't find anyone in this audience or in almost any professional audience that would vote against creativity, problem solving, and critical thinking. But there ain't no one who knows how to measure it. And until we can get some sort of proxy, Ron, that's your challenge, some sort of proxy for creativity, problem solving, and critical thinking that allows us to make judgments about teaching and learning success at these higher levels, we're going to continue to be stuck. Now, the problem is that for every bit of creativity that is genuine, you have 10 pieces of garbage. And to differentiate the garbage from the genuine creativity is something that is more than elusive. I mean, the paper on which FedEx was based received a B in the Graduate School of Business at Harvard. Bs at the Harvard Business School are like Fs. In other words, the professor who reviewed that concept found it to be less than meritorious. All right? It was genuine creativity. There is nothing against which to measure it. So how can we quantify it? Well, I think we're not going to be able to do as good a job of quantifying genuine creativity, but we might do better with problem solving, and I think we might do better with critical thinking. So let's at least start with problem solving and critical thinking and see if we can generate some robust metrics that all these people who love to measure things can find acceptable. Uh, I have real fun. Uh, I'm working in Shanghai. And you wouldn't believe the fact that I am building, helping to build in Shanghai, the first school in the world that has ever told me, 
Whatever you want to do, we'll do it. I mean, I have never had a school in the United States that would let me do anything I wanted to do. And that is scary, because it takes away all your excuses. But the nice thing is that we're building, as a prelude to that school, an American academy in a high school in Shanghai called Nanyang. Now let me tell you about that high school, because it's fun. <laughs> that there is something called the PISA and the TIMS. These are the tests of international comparison of educational progress. Now, the number one place in the world on TIMS is Shanghai. I mean, they disaggregate Shanghai, Taiwan, uh, Macau, Hong Kong as separate countries, okay? So Shanghai is number one in the world on these high-stakes tests. In Shanghai, there are 18 school districts. The number one school district in Shanghai is Hui Shui. In Hui Shui, there are 20 high schools, one of which is Nanyang. Nanyang is number five out of 20. So we are now working to establish my curriculum in what has been measured to be the fifth best high school in the world. Now isn't that great? Yeah. Now the fun part of it is that that fifth best high school in the world thinks our curriculum is probably better than theirs. Because even though the Chinese government has passed a law, you'll love this, but if you haven't worked in China you won't understand it. But they passed a law three years ago requiring all universities to be created. <laughs> yeah, it's, it's a law. <laughs> and you can laugh, but I tell you that in China, if they pass a law, they take it seriously. And then they start trying, and they do really goofy things, but they're trying. And by golly, I promise you, that at the end of the day, passing that law is going to produce some creativity. It's going to produce a whole lot of junk along the way, but it will produce creativity. I wish we had a law that at least required our universities to try to be creative, you see? Because we get always caught at the other end of it. We always get overtaken by circumstances and then struggle to keep up. And I would just long to get ahead of that curve. I mean, we now have technological options that if we had had those options in 1968, wow, could things have been different. But we didn't have those options. We didn't have anything called email or Facebook or, or you know, iPads or any of those kinds of things. We had to deal with what we thought was really outlandish, marvelous technology like overhead projectors. <laughs> and we fought hard to get overhead projectors into the classroom. And that was hard to do. You see, so we need to update the challenge. We need to find a way to transform these big three, critical thinking, problem solving, and creativity, into today's curriculum. We need to find ways to empower students uh, the last three years that I taught at Old Dominion University, my students wrote their own textbook. And the first time people hear about that, they think that is really wild and crazy. And then you spend five minutes telling them how you did it, and they say, oh, that's not so crazy after all, just five minutes. Why? Because my course in Social and Cultural Foundations, I turned into 150 topics. That was hard to do because I stacked up in eight textbooks in social and cultural foundations and found there was only about 50 or 60 percent overlap in all those eight textbooks. You could have someone in school X graduate with a course in social and cultural foundations taking something completely different than student Y in another institution and the course is called the same thing. So my son and my graduate student and I spent two days going through these eight books. <clears throat> we came up with 150 topics, and the job was that our students would pick a topic, 
No more than three students could pick the same topic. This is a large class of about 225 students. They could pick a topic to write on, and they had two to three weeks to write a thousand words on topic X. And they were explicitly told, you're not supposed to cover the topic. You're supposed to do independent research and think of the three to five things that this topic suggests are most important for a beginning teacher to know. Because this is a course to prepare beginning teachers. So you take your topic and you now put the filter on what are the three or four or five most important things for a teacher to know about that topic. And you know something? It was really easy for them to do that. Because with the internet the way it is, I could take a high school student and give her the task of taking almost any topic, you know, something, you know, even fairly technical, like fractals. You know, what should be taught to elementary kids about fractals? And I give that to a high school student and give her three weeks to write a thousand words, and she has to come up with five sources, two of which are academic, two of which are non-academic, and we required our kids to use non-academic sources. Why? Because some of the popular sources are more up to date than the academic sources. And the fifth one could be either one. Some of the kids came up with 15 different references. That was their choice. And they had to come up with a sidebar. Something that was, a, you know, like the little boxes they have in textbooks. Something to make it interesting. We had, a fan, we had fantastic textbooks. And our original idea was the first semester we'd write the textbook and then subsequent semesters the students would you know, revise it, they didn't want to have any part of that. They wanted to write their own. And so every semester we wrote a new textbook. And we took the articles that had been rated the best in the previous semester to get them started the first three or four weeks. And then the next nine weeks of the semester, they were reading each other's textbooks. And it worked. And we stopped giving examinations that emphasize what you know on Friday. And we said they could take the examination as many times as they wanted to. And there wasn't any monitoring of that because they could take it as many times as they wanted to and they were cheating only themselves if they didn't do it honestly. Now, because of university regulations, we put a firewall in that and said there had to be a monitored test in the midterm and the final. But guess what? The correlation of the unmonitored tests and the monitored test was very, very high. It was over 0.7. Thanks, Ron. Uh, <laughs> for people who care about those things. Uh, and, and we should care about those things. But one of the things that I think we need to care about more is in really empowering our students and putting more emphasis on the access to information, more emphasis on evaluating information, more emphasis on prioritizing information, because we're buried under information. And schools are still acting like information is scarce. So we gotta, we gotta change. And so I'm challenging the School of Education here to find some levers to produce that change. To find some levers to attract the most exciting people in the country to come here to study and bear witness and be a part of the process. And that's what will propel the School of Education into the future. So there's a lot of strong people here. There's wonderful leadership. There's a great vision. We need to find something to help it get unstuck. Thank you very much. like now is for people to take the opportunity to come up and just be brief <laughs> but just say yeah a few words if you want to about Dwight I thought you might and introduce yourself to hi I'm Asha Rajan and uh, I just this better I'm Asha Redman and I retired from the school that um, 
three years ago, but I come in just about every day, doing stuff with the library and with a new book and things like that. But anyway, when I heard that Dwight was coming, my heart just leaped. He has changed my life, as he has many of yours. And I want to tell you two brief anecdotes, just to show his leadership style. One, when Dwight came, the provost said to him, you need to change this school. And you need to really turn it so that it is the best ever. And I'll support you. So Dwight said, well, he wanted it. We had about 24 faculty then. I was an instructor, not permitted to vote at faculty meetings. Um, and uh, Dwight said, well, he wanted about five more teachers, 15 more teachers, and I said yes. And we didn't have any doctoral programs then, but Dwight said he wanted to have um, something called planning doctorates to help him to design a new school of education. And the planning doctorates would be recruited from all over the place, and he wanted 11 of those. He got 91. Where, where's the picture going around of the Colorado retreat? It's over right here on the reception table. Just hold it up to show how many people are there. Whoa. Dick Konacek went for a one-on-one -on -one conversation with Dwight. Dwight called each one of us into his office at, um, one at a time. And Dick said that he uh, thought that it would be a good idea if Dwight took us and the planning doctors on a retreat so that we could design a new school of education. And they thought, wait me in, <laughs> someplace close by. And Dwight said, no, if they could get into a car and go home at night, that wouldn't work. So he wrote a proposal. People didn't believe it later on, but he wrote a proposal to charter a plane and to charter, uh, I think it was a Sanborn horse ranch at the foot of Pikes Peak. And we all flew out there, all 200 of us. And morning, noon, and night, we designed a new school of education. So Dwight took the idea from somebody else and didn't say that's not a good idea, said, that's a great idea, I'll make it greater. <laughs> the other is uh, personal with me. I was an instructor, had been an instructor for three years, and uh, I was taking, I was doing my PhD in English here uh, at the <coughs> university because the old dean said to me, if you want to stay teaching here, and I would like you to, uh, you have to have your doctorate. So, and he said, and of course you can't take it here at the School of Ed. You can't take courses from your colleagues. So I said, okay, and I dutifully went over to the English department and was ready for my comps when Dwight came. And he called me into his office. And as I told people at lunch, I thought he was going to fire me. Um, and he asked me what I wanted to do and what was going on. And I told him that uh, I wanted to stay teaching at the school. And he said, well, that would be fine. Would I like to be one of his planning doctorates? I said, well, how would that work? And he said, well, you'd have to quit your job as instructor. I'm the sole um, earner in the family. My husband's going to school and recuperating from a serious heart attack. I've got three kids. I can't quit my job. And Dry said, well, you know, the odds are against you. And he gives me a figure of how many people can succeed in doing all of that at once. And I said, well, I would like to take the chance if he would. And so he did. And not only did he say yes, and truly no was never the right answer with him. Not only did he say yes, but he worked it so that I was the director of a reading and language arts um, model program for teacher education that I had gotten funding from Jim Cooper was the director. And um, he made me the head. And he supported me in every way possible so that my evaluation and presentation of, my, of the new program became my dissertation. So we tried to do some other new things with the dissertation. We wanted Mary Alice Wilson to have a co-dissertation with me. I do the, the bulk of it. She does the assessment of it. 
they wouldn't let us do that. So, that wasn't me. No, 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 it wasn't you. It definitely was not you. Uh, but we did it anyway. <laughs> Only we did it in two chunks rather than integrating. Anyway, that's, that's the kind of leadership and the kind of caring and the kind of sticking to his principles that Dwight never failed to show us. And I thank you. Hi, everyone. <clears throat> I'm Smitty. Probably most of you recognize me because I haven't changed in 40 years. <laughs> but uh, I just wanted to uh, make a couple of remarks about another aspect of Dwight, uh, who is uh, uh, my dear brother and mentor. Um, <clears throat> and that is that along with all the educational innovation that went on at the School of Education here, uh, importantly, extremely importantly, uh, is that Dwight change the face of this university in color. When we came here in 1968, the SEBS program and the School of Education literally descended a bunch of black and brown people on this campus that this campus had never seen before. His connection and the way he did it, my story is just probably one of many I met Dwight two months before I came here at a conference for people basically who were hellraisers uh, and who had been called into a meeting. I'm a member of the Baha'i Faith and we had this thing going in South Carolina where we had an armed camp and we were being told, hey, you can't do this, you can't think about killing people. And Dwight was one of the people who came to talk to us about how we might do constructive change. I met him. He says, wow, what are you doing in the fall? I says, I'm an ex-footballer. i just come back from Vietnam. I'd gotten a scholarship walk on at Northwestern University, not because of academics, but because I was a good ball player. So I said, you don't want to go there. You want to come to the School of Education. It's, what are you talking about? He says, yeah. He says, we've got some dynamic things that are going to happen. You'll come as an undergraduate. Matter of fact, you'll be one of my special undergraduate students, because I hadn't finished Wake Forest University, where I started in 64. Anyway, long story short, to get him off my back, I said, well, you get me in, I'll come. I went back to South Carolina. This was on a weekend, on a Sunday. On Tuesday, the FedEx story converges. I'm coming home. My nephew's sitting on the porch. He says, Uncle Butch, you got a FedEx. Now, this, this is when FedEx just started. I opened the package. Here's this whole application for the University of Massachusetts. It was from Wilma. Wilma had prepared this stuff and sent it to me. I said, damn. So I signed it. <laughs> that was a return envelope in the thing FedEx. Sent it back Friday. I sent it back on Tuesday. Friday, I get a letter. Welcome to the University of Massachusetts. You've been accepted as a student. My mother says to me, my family name is Butch. Butch, what is all this FedEx stuff? I said, well, I met this guy who's the dean at the School of Education, and he wants me to come to UMass, but actually, I'm just, you know, I'm going to North, I'm going to go to Northwest. And I'm, you know. She says, well, why did he do all this? Did you tell him you were coming there? And I said, yes, ma'am, I told him that. She said, well, then you going. <laughs> so, that's how I came to the school there. I was blessed to be in that group that went to Pikes Peak. There were two undergraduate students, Bob Henderson and myself. Uh, and uh, it's just, you've given so many people life. And we love you. Steve Hillier, uh, I grew up in uh, South Hadley. I was 12 years old when David and Penny Walker and Mark Sedan and Jim Thoreau moved into South Hadley. And, um, there I was a Catholic, a 
was going to junior high school fellowship at the uh, congregational church, and everybody there was going down on Tuesday nights to David and Penny Walker's house in uh, in South Hadley, and every Tuesday there was a college level course on some aspect of social justice or uh, different religions of the world or different cultures, and it was a parade of students from the School of Ed at UMass. And uh, I would ask the toughest questions I could think of, and I got serious answers from doctoral students when I was 12 years old. This has a transformative uh, effect on a young person to be taken seriously at 12 years old. I have never since underestimated the potential of a middle school student. People say middle school students are the most difficult age to teach. That's because they want to know. And the teachers have nothing in their curriculum to offer them whatsoever. And so the first adult that will give them a serious answer to the questions they have at that age uh, will change their lives forever. Edwin Lero was a teacher at U at uh, Little School in South Hadley, uh, sixth grade. He told me uh, he had taught college, he had taught high school, and he said, I have no idea how to teach sixth grade, so I'm not going to do it. I'm, gonna, I'm going to talk about Latin America, and I'm going to talk about all the problems, and I'm going to have you design a city. And we were, we were absolutely amazed and thrilled. I wrote a paper on the Peace Corps in sixth grade that I submitted with my Peace Corps application when I got out of this university. Um, so I would just like to thank all of the creativity of UMass. I, uh, when I was at UMass, uh, Dwight was the advisor for the Baha'i Club and I was the president and we got to travel to New York to the UN when he gave talks and uh, I thank you for taking me under your wing and I also say uh, that feeling that anything is possible uh, lives on, it gets buried sometimes, but I, I want to thank you to, for taking a 12 year old seriously. Thank you. Hi, Dean. Uh, my name is John Barbaro, and I wanted to thank you for. I'm I'm now a professional psychologist, and I and I help a lot of people. I think, and uh, I work in Amherst, and I wanted to tell you the difference you made in my life. Uh, I heard about uh, this Dwight Allen, who was new dean at the School of Education when I was uh, graduating as a, a psych major at UMass. And um, I needed a graduate program that would allow me to take the uh, national exam for psychologists, and I didn't have the grades. But there was a, a professor that you hired named uh, Jerry Weinstein, and he did uh, education of the self, and I talked to him, and I became a member of his group, and I became a doctoral student under Jerry Weinstein, and uh, I got my doctorate designed it so that I could meet the requirements for the, the exam, took the exam and passed. And I think it's uh, one of your effects, and I wanted to thank you for that. Thanks for oh, coming. Hi, I'm Dave Schemmel. At the end of the 60s and early 70s, there was this young dean who was dynamic, energetic, creative, provocative, inspiring to change, and, you know, it was pretty good, but, you know, it was a young guy with a new opportunity, not surprising. Fast forward 45 years, and here's a guy who's dynamic, energetic, <laughs> creative, provocative, open to change. You know, it's a tremendous role model for adding years, but not growing old. Thanks for being that role model. Hi, I have 
to say that that's the perfect place to stop with the public comments, but this does not prevent us from, we have food, we have some beer and wine, and we have some other refreshments to mill around and to speak to Dwight and to tell him, you know, uh, and, and to others here, because I'm sure some of you are looking around going, wow, it's really great to see you. So um, thank you, and thank you, Dwight. And we're looking forward to figuring out, do we know how to put this up on the brick wall yet? <laughs> we do. Yes. We do. We do. They're coming when? No, we have. It's all set. It's all set. It's all set. We just have to hang it. We just have to hang it. Is that... It's not our... Linda, is that a, another place. duty as assigned? <laughs> I'll get right on it. Yeah. Okay. All right. So it'll be up soon. The fabulous. But I'm, I'm aware that it's chilly here, and I want to make sure that uh, people are comfortable. So... Thank you so much. Oh, we're going to hand out the rest of Dwight's comments. We can hand them out or we can have them on the table if people want to pick them up. Not Dwight, but Tim's comments with the picture of the portrait and the artist. So you can see that as well because we thought that would be important. You can see a picture of Tim. So, thank you, Tim. Thanks, Tim. <laughs>